Those coronary arteries are these blood vessels that surround the heart. So this is the heart without the core. I mean, this is what the coronary arteries look like without the heart itself. So the, this is like a network of arteries and capillaries that are supplying the heart with the blood that it needs. It's one of the first branches off the aorta brings that blood to the coronary arteries. And so if the heart loses its supply of blood for some reason, and the heart stops working, the muscles don't have enough energy, they don't have enough oxygen or nutrients, then basically the heart stops working, stops pumping blood to all the other parts of the body, and that can be fatal. So why would this stop working? Why would these coronary arteries stop supplying the heart muscle with the um, blood that it needs? What could happen in our, our arteries? arteries? That is? Yeah, they can basically get clogged with what? Fat. Yeah, cholesterol, fats. We call these things plaques that can build up and they can um, lead to a restriction in the flow of blood in the heart. This disease is called atherosclerosis. It is the thickening of the artery walls due to the buildup of these plaques inside of the artery. So this, um, this model shows sort of the stages of that buildup from a, a nice smooth artery that does not have any fatty substances built up to it, that fat building up thicker and thicker until basically you can pass that around the flow of blood to a certain part of the heart is lost. And if that happens, some of the first symptoms of this starting to happen, of that artery being narrowed, of a lack of blood flow to the heart, is what's called angina. That means chest pain. So a person might exhibit signs of pain in their chest, sometimes radiating down their arms. This would be sort of the, they might be short of breath, they might get um, tired very easily. And so these are some of the signs that a person might go to their doctor to seek help. Those are typical um, telltale signs of some sort of um, heart disease. If this progresses and blood flow to a part of the heart completely stops, that could lead to a heart attack, to the heart's um, inability to continue to function. As if the heart muscle loses its supply of blood, it starts to die and stops working. So what are the things that increase the risk of this buildup of this atherosclerosis? Well, diet. Diet's high in, in uh, fats, and saturated fats, high in uh, cholesterol, um, obesity, diabetes, smoking, and high blood pressure. All of these things, they don't if a person has one of these, these risk factors, it doesn't mean they're going to get heart disease, but each of them sort of increases one's risk at developing heart disease. And um, so what, are, what can they do? So if these arteries that feed the heart blood are clogged, if they're looking like the last couple stages here, then what are the treatments? Anyone know? Oh, yeah. So probably many of you know someone, a relative maybe, or a friend's relative, um, often an older person maybe, that's had some heart disease and have had to seek some sort of treatment. So does anyone know? Don't they like take, like say you had like, an artery clogged or something because of the like, thickening walls, wouldn't they take out that artery and like replace it with a different artery that's in your body? That's one, that's sort of like, one of the last treatments they would do because that this, um, it's pretty invasive. But we'll talk about that. But yes, you know what they call that? Heart transplant. Not, they're not transplanting <laughs> a heart. They can the artery, transplant. The artery the heart. transplant. No. They just require the organs. Yeah, it's called a bypass surgery, heart bypass surgery, in which they're at um, coronary artery, by, I'm sorry, bypass surgery, when they're basically routing the blood around the blockage. I'll show you that in a minute. There's another thing you may have heard of, is um, angioplasty, have you ever heard of I've that? I've heard of that. 
Angioplasty is a way of doing a couple things. Angioplasty can be used to see and to allow the doctor to visualize how um, those arteries, whether or not they're clogged. In doing an angioplasty, you would go to a doctor's office. Um, it's called a cardiac catheterization. And you would go, the doctor would take this very thin wire. They would start with like a large syringe. They would put it into uh, the femoral artery in the groin, like right in your hip area. And then they have this very tiny wire that they can guide through your blood vessels. At the same time, they're looking at um, a scan of your body so they can track where that wire is going. They put this wire often in the groin, but sometimes in the arm, all the way up through our artery, all the way through your torso. They loop it around into the aorta and into the coronary arteries. They can then inject a dye, which shows up on the scans, and they can see if the arteries are blocked or not. They can see exactly where the blockage is. They can see how much blockage there is. And so that allows them to see sort of where, um, where this damage is or where this blockage is, how significant it is. And then they might decide to do a treatment. So while that, it's called a catheter, while that's in there, they can also put at the end of it this very small sort of balloon, and they get this balloon into the area of the blockage, and then they inflate it. It's, it's deflated when they're working it in. They get it to the blockage, inflate it, and that kind of squishes, here you see the balloon inflating, sort of opening up that blocked area um, to allow for better blood flow through it. That's one thing they can do. But another thing that's often done is not only do they do that balloon inflation, but they have a, what's called a stent that they can put in. Has anyone ever heard of somebody getting a stent put into their arteries? It's basically like a reinforcement. It's now typically made of this metal mesh. Often they're medicated, so <laughs> things don't stick to them. And they put that in along with the balloon. When they inflate the balloon, it inflates the mesh, the metal mesh, and it locks into place. And that hopefully will allow the blood vessel to stay open for a longer period of time. Okay, it's kind of like reinforcing it. Now that doesn't always work though. Sometimes the, the stent doesn't work and the flow of blood is still restricted. Okay, and there's just another example. So here's a, where this blockage is occurring, this narrowing of the coronary artery. Okay, the stent's put in to hopefully keep it open. Now, if that's not working, and what Colin was talking about was bypass surgery. So this is called coronary artery bypass surgery. And if there is a blockage, so the blockage could happen in several of the arteries. And so here what we see in this person's heart before the surgery, here's their coronary arteries, okay? And there's a blockage here and here. So as blood is traveling through the aorta, it goes down into the artery, but it gets this blockage. So this part of the heart would be getting blood, okay? but these parts of the heart would not be getting blood because the blood can't get through very well. Same thing on this side. This blood coming from the coronary artery is not able to flow past this. So what they can do is a couple things. One is they can take a vein from a person's leg, basically cut it out, take it, and then insert it. They basically stitch it in place. <coughs> They attach one end to the aorta. The other end goes past the blockage somewhere. So now as blood's going through the aorta, it can go through this new vein that got um, patched in, and that blood can flow through that, and it can provide blood to the other parts there. So it's called bypass, because it's going around the blockage. It's bypassing the damage. Another way to do it is through using this mammary artery. So there's naturally an artery here which usually connects in a person's chest. They can cut it from the chest and then replace it and attach this end to the other side of the heart past the blockage. So again, as blood's going through this aorta, some of that blood comes through and can go past the blockage bypassing it. And this can provide better flow of blood to those parts of the heart. But this is can be a pretty, um, dangerous surgery. It's a surgery that in a traditional way of doing it requires a very long recovery. 
to do this surgery, they need to, if they're doing this open heart, so this is called open heart surgery, the way they do it. Basically, they um, cut through a person's skin in their sternum, cut through their pectoral muscles, then they have to saw through the sternum bone. They put in a rib spreader, which they crank and it opens up between the parts of their sternum so they can access the heart. They have to stop the heart and they attach a person to a heart and lung machine, which basically breathes for them and pumps their blood because they need to do the surgery on the heart. Okay. Once they've done their surgery, they need to then staple back the sternum so it will heal, that bone will heal. Okay, suture the muscle and the skin. And it takes a long time. You have a huge scar for recovery. Um, I used to play basketball here on Wednesday nights and there was this one old guy who used to come and play and sometimes he would take off his shirt and he had this huge scar of where he had had open heart surgery and I was like kind of nervous playing, playing basketball with this guy because he just had open heart surgery like nobody wanted to to follow them or knock them down or anything, but it's a huge scar. So that's a dangerous, I think there's some picture. That's a rib spreader. There is a picture coming up, I think, of an actual, not, it's just a picture, not a video, of the rib spreader in a person's chest with their rib spread so that you can see the heart. So if you don't like this, I, I don't know. Oh, so that's just, I think the next one is an actual picture. Oh, what? oh, I thought it was going to be like... It is. So I think the next one's an actual picture. So, here you see... You know, so you can't see... Guys, guys, listen. So, you, uh, these are the edges of the rib spread that are, that are in the chest. They've cranked it down to sort of open it up. Okay, it's connected. Some of these tubes connect the blood supply to the heart and lung machine. Some are for suction. And so the doctor can then access the heart to do the surgery. Now, yeah, today, there are oh, yeah, modern, <laughs> so there are more modern ways of doing surgery that are less invasive. And so this is one of them. So there are several types of these, um, it's called robotic assisted surgery. So a robot is not doing surgery on a person, okay? What's happening is the doctor is controlling the tools, so the doctor sits at a console here. Um, the patient would be here on the bed. These are the arms of the robotic uh, assist surger, surgery tool. And um, what they do is these have long um, tools that just sort of, rather than opening up a person's chest, they poke into their body. They can poke them in through between ribs, they can poke one in underneath through the belly button, below the rib cage. So what this means is they can do surgery without cutting open your whole body and exposing these parts. Because the end of these tools have cameras. So as the doctor is looking and he gets a three-dimensional view of the tools inside of the body, the, I got to use one of these once just to play around, not on a person. <laughs> but, so the doctor's hands in here basically has two fingers are Velcroed into this tool, and as the doctor opens and closes these, his fingers, the tools at the end open and close. As the doctor moves his hands forward and backward and rotates his wrist, the tools inside the person rotate, okay? And so he has pedals you can use to move things with your foot. And you can do very fine surgery using these tools. You probably saw videos of somebody like doing surgery on a grave yeah. that was popular. They were using a robot like this. Um, this is somebody folding up a tiny little paper airplane um, using this, this Da Vinci robot. So basically this allows for these surgeries that are much less invasive, that allow for a much quicker recovery for a person. Um, and they can do lots of surgery. So my father had his prostate, uh, he had prostate cancer. He had part of his prostate gland removed. They did it using this Da Vinci robot. So it's not only for heart surgery. It can be used for surgery all over the body. And it's just a way to do surgery without having to open up the persons uh, to expose their organs. Yeah, and once a doctor, so the, the demo thing I did, they brought this robot to the high school. 
and you could just go in and play with it. So they have like rubber bands, you could try and put them on certain things, you could try the different tools. So I was only doing it for maybe 10 minutes, but you can get the hang out. A doctor who's practiced this for years can do very, very intricate surgeries using these tools. And because Oh, that's, so that's good. A doctor can't get there, so this is smaller than a dime. It's, this robot can make very fine movements that even a doctor might not be able to make inside of a person's body. Uh, what happens, like, because you said you, they take the, uh, the vein from the leg, what happens to the leg? Yeah, no, it's that's just a vein that you re could reroute it, or there's other veins to bring that blood back up to the heart. So that's a good question. I'll also, um, what was I gonna say? Uh, oh yeah, how like so when they have like the, like the rib spreader, the rib spreader and stuff, and they have the lung and heart machine or whatever it's called. Um, how do they like make sure that the the heart that they just did the surgery on will work properly? Um, I guess they they probably reconnect everything, take the person off the heart and lung machine. If they find it hasn't, then they probably need to do like emergency surgery to make sure it does. It's cool. fairly it's common surgery, so it's something that's been done, you know, many, many times. All right, we need to finish up with blood types today. Um, so, does anyone know their blood type? Yeah. yeah. Like a, I don't know. What's the So, you may have, it's probably somewhere on your, in your file at your doctor's office. Next time you go to the doctor, you might be able to ask. So, when we talk about blood types, on our blood cells, on our red blood cells, we have special proteins called antigens. And in humans, there are two types of antigens. There's A antigens and B antigens. And your blood type is named by which antigens you have on your red blood cells. A person with type A blood has A antigens. A person with type B blood has B antigens. They are, have a different to them. A person with both types of antigens is AB blood. And some people have no antigens on the red blood cells. That's type O blood. That gives us our four possible blood types. Where do like, like, I, like negative and like positive? Yeah. We'll get to that at the end today. And so we inherit our blood type from our parents. Your blood type is genetic. We'll talk about those genes maybe as we get to our next unit. Holly? If someone has like A, B, do they get like, can they get like blood transplants from anyone? Yeah, so we'll talk about that. So this is important in terms of blood transfusions. So because if we, inside of our blood, part of our immune system, we have antibodies that help fight off foreign cells. So that's where this blood typing becomes important. Because if a person has A antigens on their red blood cells and in their bloodstream have antibodies that attack those A antigens, you think that's a good situation? No. Those antibodies clump up the blood cells, the blood cells no longer work, and so it's a dangerous situation. It leads to damage to blood cells called hemolysis. So if a person has type A blood, they have A antigens on the red blood cells, do you think they have any A antibodies in their plasma? No. No, because they would die. But oh. they do have B. B antibodies there. A person with type B blood, what type of antigens are on their red blood cells? B. What type of antibodies do you think are in their plasma? A. Right. So you got A what about type AB blood? What antigens do they have? A and B. So what do you think they have? Which type of antibodies? Oh, oh. none. Neither. Oh, wow. Oh, so they die easy? Nope. <laughs> A person with type O blood, what type of antigens are on their red blood cells? None. Neither. And so in their plasma, they can have? A and B. A and B antibodies. So the, a problem could arise when 
blood from one person is transfused into another person in a way in which the antibodies and antigens match. And that can lead to hemolysis and could lead to death. So we think about this. When a person, say there was a, a bad accident, a person lost a fair amount of blood. And so they get to the emergency room, they've lost too much blood, they may need blood transfused into their body. Okay? And so when they do that, they typically are just giving a person red blood cells. That's all they're getting. Not even plasma? Nope. Okay. So, type O blood is known as the universal donor. Why can anybody get type O blood put into them? Tyler? It has both of them in it. Nope. Ali? It has neither A or B antigens on the red blood cells. So if you put it in anyone's body, it's not going to react with any antibodies. So that's okay. A person, because it has no antigens on it, anyone can receive it. What about type AB blood? What antibodies do they have in their plasma? Neither. neither. So who can they get blood from? A and B. Anybody. Because they have none of these A and B antibodies that are going to match with it. So they are called the universal recipient. So what this means is when a person gets a transfusion, it has to be matched with their blood type. A person with type A blood can get other type A blood or they can get type O. Person with type B blood? B or O. Can get B or O. Oh, person with AB can get? Anything. A person with type O blood can only get O. So if you ever see like doctor shows or hospital shows on TV, somebody comes in on Grey's Anatomy and they need blood, what type do they give them? O. They start them off with O negative blood because anyone can receive that. Once they actually find their actual blood type, they might switch and give them a matching blood type, but type O blood, because it's universal donor, is the first blood given. Um, type O is actually the most common. Type A is second most common. This is me, I'm type B. And then AB is the rarest blood type. Now, those, somebody asked earlier, oh, here is the, uh, in the United States, positive, these positive and negatives. So there are these A and B antigens and antibodies, but there's another set of antigens. There's actually many others. The most commonly discussed one is these Rh factors. They were discovered in this Rh monkey. Must be related to Mr. Akiri. Um, and so if a person is Rh positive, it means they have these Rh antigens also on their blood cells. Most people do have them, 85%. So here you see um, different types of blood types. So this becomes important in blood transfusions. Also, it becomes very important in pregnancy. If a mother is Rh um, negative and her fetus is Rh positive, it can uh, provide a conflict during childbirth. So they have to be uh, they take certain medications and there's certain precautions that need to be taken. Uh, yes. Uh, can we go back to the 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 O negatives and stuff? This one? Uh, yeah, that one. Yep. Those look like little like prestige tokens you get for leveling up the car. Wow. Yeah. <laughs>